So do you see the presentation perfectly? Yes. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, I would like to thank you for this kind invitation that at the end, I mean, it came last week, I guess. So, I mean, for me, it's, uh, it's no problem at all. So I thank you for the invitation. Okay. It's a pleasure for me to talk about uh, polarimetry in one hour. I mean, I will try to give just the, the main points about uh, polarimetry with this uh, presentation. Okay. And good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody, because I have seen that there are many people from everywhere, even from Australia, which is really early in the morning. Here is uh, late in the afternoon, it's 7 p.m. in Barcelona. So uh, about this talk on cell polarimetry, uh, this is the title of the presentation, Signal Processing of uh, Polarimetric SAR, the Detection and Parameter Extraction. So first of all, here you have my contact information. I mean, feel free to send me an email if you have doubts or whatever. Okay, here you have the contact information and you can Google my name and you can get this, this information too without any problem. So let's go to the, to the lecture. Which are the objectives of this lecture? First of all, uh, is to, to give you, uh, to introduce the principles of uh, polarimetric synthetic aperture radar, uh, remote sensing for earth observation. The second point is how to explore the physical information content, how to extract this information. And finally, to present a few applications of, uh, of a polarimetric set. I will focus on two of them. One is classification, quite classical. The other one is how to use polarimetric information to improve change detection, which I think it's a, a, a hot topic now, especially in uh, considering the availability of inform polarimetric information in the case of Sentinel. So having this in mind, the, these objectives, this is going to be the, the outline of the talk. A brief introduction, a few words about wave polarimetry. How, what does it mean polarimetry itself? And how do we use polarimetry in the frame of sun? And this is, will go with the scattering polarimetry. And finally, I will go uh, through this, uh, this application. So let's go to the introduction. When we talk about SAR, we have different configurations. We go from the most simple synthetic aperture radar, where we take one image of the area we want to, to study. Then we go to interferometry, differential interferometry, polarimetry, uh, polarimetric cell interferometry, tomography, multitemporal, and so on. The main difference among all these uh, configurations is the num basically is the number of channels of information you have. In the case of polarimetry, you may have three and four, but it's not only the, uh, the number of channels, it's the way you acquire these channels, the, the diversity you use to obtain these channels. In interferometry, you use a special diversity and you are sensitive to topography. In the case of polarimetry, you change, your diversity is, uh, is the polarization of the, of the wave. We play with the polarization of the waves. And thanks to that, we, have, we may have information about the geometry of the target, essentially, and information about the water content, okay? So when we refer to the number of channels, I mean, we have an increase of information, but the increase of information does not only come from the fact that we have several channels. In here, I put three, HH, HB, BB, but, because there is a correlation between these channels. They are statistically similar. And indeed, this correlation coefficient, the correlation between the different channels is the most important radar observable. In the case of interferometry, this correlation, the phase contains the topographic information. In the case of the talk today in polarimetry, the information is contained both in the amplitude and in the phase, okay? This is the overall framework for, or just to put in place polarimetry in, in the ecosystem of SAR, uh, of SAR configurations. So let's go 
to start polarimetry, to, to wave polarimetry, sorry. So when we talk about polarimetry, uh, normally we refer to the polarization state of an electromagnetic wave. So when we play with uh, electromagnetic waves, we need to uh, play with the Maxwell equations, okay? So the Maxwell equations give us the solution of the electric field that we are dealing with. In the case of uh, in, uh, propagation in free space, the solution of the uh, electromagnetic field or the electric field we have is this solution in here, okay? So if we think, if we consider that our field uh, propagates in the set direction, we have only transversal components. In this case, the components in X and Y. So basically our uh, electric, electric field is the red arrow in here that describes an helix uh, during its propagation. So we can decompose this, this uh, vector in two components, the component in X that I have represented here in blue and the component in Y, which is represented in green. So basically, polarization refers to the vector nature of this electromagnetic field. So for instance, if we cut one slide of, uh, of, this, of this propagating field in, a, in a perpendicular to the propagation direction, and we let the vector run, we observe that the tip of the vector describes this ellipse in the most general case. So this is what we call polarization ellipse. So basically, you must understand that polarization refers to the vectorial nature of the electromagnetic field. It's nothing more than that. Depending on the properties of the field, we, the tip describes different shapes. So we may have a horizontal polarization state. So in that case, we only have a component in the x-axis. And this is referred to the classical horizontal polarization state or linear horizontal polarization state. We may have the same a vertical polarization state in which the fields only varies in the vertical direction, or we can have an arbitrary linear polarization state. So in that case, the vector only varies in a plane, horizontal, vertical, or tilted. We can have also the opposite. Uh, the opposite is that the component in X and Y and in complete counterface, so in that case, what uh, we have is that the electric field describes a circle. Then the circle can be described in the left sense on the clockwise and the, or anti-clockwise. So then we have the two polarization states. Again, these two uh, polarization states is nothing more than the reflex of the vectorial nature of the, of the, of the electromagnetic field. If, if, if I go back, for instance, it can be defined that the horizontal and the vertical are orthogonal polarization states. I mean, you have to understand that to describe polarization, we need, uh, we need to go uh, to algebra because we need to describe vectors. In the same way as horizontal and vertical are orthogonal polarization states, left circular and right circular are also orthogonal polarization states. Linear and circular are the two extremes. In the middle, what we can have is the, ellip the elliptical polarization states, okay? Uh, we have uh, one described in one sense and the other described in the other sense. Okay, okay. but what happens when, uh, but what happens when we deal with uh, natural targets, okay? As I have described it before, the polarization state, state is stable in space and time. If the polarization stays, state stays stable, we say that the hour wave is completely polarized. In that particular case, there are no major issues when processing the, or when dealing with the polarization state, and we can extract complete information from the, uh, from the polarization state of the wave. Nevertheless, the electromagnetic field 
reflects, as I indicated here, the microscopic arrangement of elementary targets in the resolution cell. So therefore, when we deal with uh, distributed targets, distributed scatters, which correspond essentially to natural targets, there is a randomness in the arrangement of these natural targets. So therefore, the polarization state of the waves dealing with distributed targets are is random, the polarization state. Therefore, we have in partially polarized waves. So in that particular case, the polarimetric information only takes sense from an stochastic point of view. So therefore, we need to define somehow the mean polarization state of the wave, okay? I mean, I let, uh, I let this part for, for, a follow, for a follow session because it, you need to define a new set of polarization descriptors, which is are out of the scope of this, uh, of this talk. But essentially, you, uh, you need to consider that when uh, we deal with uh, natural targets, this polarization state varies and our wave is partially polarized, okay? Up to now, we have defined the polarization state of a wave. So if we go to a radar, we have defined the polarization state of the transmitted wave and the polarization state of the receiving wave, of the received wave. When we deal with radar, we don't analyze strictly the electric fields, but we analyze the scattering process. So now we need to define the concept of scattering polarimetry. So this is basically what I have represented in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this scheme here. So this is a very simple scattering problem in uh, two media, okay? So what we have is one incident electromagnetic wave that goes to the, uh, to the transition of these two medias. And in the transition, we create a scattered wave and a transmitted wave. So, the three waves, the incident, the scattered, and the transmitted, are characterized by a polarization state. Okay? We are only interested in, in the case of radar in the incident and the scattered waves. So our question now is that if we analyze the incident wave and the scattered wave, and both have a polarization state, the reason to play with polarization is the following. The scatter may, in, in this scattering process, may change the polarization state of the wave. So therefore, the idea is that this change of the polarization state may contain some information about the properties of the target. That this is the, the, the point we want to retrieve with SAR we send one polarization state, we receive another polarization state from the change we want to retrieve the properties of the turf. In this particular case of the incidence in a flat surface, I have represented here in a very simple way, we only change the amplitude of the, what is called the copolar uh, states. So basically if we send horizontal, this scattering process only changes the amplitude of the horizontal. It doesn't induce a, or it doesn't uh, change uh, power from one polarization to another. But this is in, in, in this very simple example. So as you see, this matrix is diagonal. So basically this matrix indicates us which is our, how the target changes the polarization of the incident wave and we receive the scattered wave. So basically our idea is to estimate the properties of the target from this matrix. In a general case, we are lucky because in a general case, there is also a transport of power from one channel to the other, from one polarization state to the other. So basically what we have is this full matrix where every element is a complex element. So basically, what we need is how to estimate this scattering matrix. And the important thing is that this matrix contains four elements. In a single SAR image, what we have is one of the, 
one of the diagonal elements. In most of the cases, we have the SVB. When we play with polarization, we have, I mean, in the monostatic case, we will have three because HV will be equal to BH. So basically, we have more channels of information. And the advantage is that this matrix depends on the target, on the scattering, depends essentially on the shape, on the geometry of the target, on the material, on the water content, but through the electrical properties or our, uh, how these uh, properties express in terms of electrical properties. Of course, the scattering matrix depends also on the wave frequency. And this is clear. Uh, lower frequencies have more penetration. So therefore, uh, they can penetrate forests. And this is, for instance, the, the goal of biomass mission or, or the NICER mission. They play at P1, at L1. So they expect to see the, the, the ground. For instance, higher uh, frequencies like X1, like the, the German Terrasar X, they do not penetrate into vegetation to the, the short wavelength. So basically, the, the properties of the matrix depend also on the, on the wave frequency. Depends on the, on the geometry of the measure. This is also why depolarization uh, properties or parametric properties depend on the incidence angle. Okay, Technically, it depends also on the coordinate system. And the most important thing is that all the elements must be taken at the same time because they have all to refer to the same, uh, to the same target. How we, do we make it uh, with radars? So basically the idea is the following. In a single radar or a single polarization radar, what we have is the transmitter and the receiver. We send, in this case, uh, a wave with uh, horizontal polarization. We receive the echo at the same polarization state, okay? What we can make is to have a second receiver tuned at the vertical polarization state, okay? So therefore, if we play with two receivers, what we can measure is one column of the scattering matrix. In this particular case, we transmit in H and we receive in both B and H. For instance, this is the configuration of the Sentinel-1 system. It's a, it only measures the SBB and the S. HP, okay? But this is the configuration, a dual pole system. But if we want to measure um, uh, the, the complete scattering matrix, we need also to have the capability to transmit at the orthogonal polarization state. So basically what we make here is we transmit in H and we receive in both in H and B. Therefore, we measure one column of the scattering matrix. And in order to make the opposite, we transmit in B and we receive in both channels. So therefore, we are able to, um, to measure the complete scattering matrix. So as you can see, we cannot measure the four elements at the same time because we, were, we won't be able to distinguish uh, the origin of the power, if it comes from the horizontal on the vertical. And the, the, the basic way to separate the different echoes is through time. It's the only possible way. The only problem with polarimetric systems is that we need to double the pure pulse repetition frequency in order to allocate the two polarization states. And the main uh, limitation that this induces into the SAR images is that it reduces the swath in one half, okay? This is the way we measure the scattering matrix. What happens with canonical targets? Why we, can, we, why we have a better discrimination? Because we have more, uh, more channels. In here, I have included the scattering matrices for several, corner, uh, for several canonical or canonic uh, targets, a sphere, a dihedral, a trihedral corner reflector, uh, short uh, thin cylinder, and uh, some eggs left and right. So if you pay attention to the trihedral and to the, the, uh, the trihedral, I mean, if I had a system that only measures the first element of the matrix, in both cases is one, and without taking into account the power, okay, it won't, I won't be able to distinguish both targets. Nevertheless, if I have the polarimetric system, you can see that you can distinguish 
these two targets through the second element, because in the case of the dihedral, it has a negative sign. In the case of the dihedral, it has a positive sign. So basically, polarimetry gives us more channels uh, of information. So more, uh, we are able to increase the capability to distinguish targets. So how many channels? At the end, the question is, how many informa information, information channels do we have? OK? And this is maybe the most important slides of the whole uh, lecture today, because I mean, in the case of the monostatic case, when we have the transmitter and the receiver into the same position, okay, HP is equal to BH, okay? So we eliminate one of the elements or two or three elements because they are complex. And we have also to eliminate the absolute phase. So if we take into account all this, at the end, what we see is that we have an observation space of five dimensions. The amplitude of the three terms, the SHH, the SBB, the SHB, the amplitudes, and the two phase differences, the phase between the HH and the BB, and the difference between the HH and the HB. So as you can see, with polar imagery, we can distinguish, we can have a better characterization of the targets because we have five different parameters. With a single, SAR, uh, single channel SAR system, you have, in the case of uh, this uh, distributed target, you have only, uh, uh, or you have two dimensions, the amplitude at the face of one channel. And at the end, it reduces to one because you have also the absolute phase. So we go from one to five dimensions. So more channels, more information. But when I refer to the information, what kind of information do we have? And this is also important to know. If we combine in an intelligent way the elements, we can get some information about the geometry of the target. What I represent here is the so-called Pauli components. So basically, uh, if I'm able to, to create these three components, HH, plus VB, HH minus VB, and HV. I mean, whenever I have a HH plus VB component is high, I can tell that the type of target I have is a surface scattering, single bounce. Whenever HH minus VB is high, I can relate that with double bounce. And where do we have double bounce? As I uh, show in this picture, is well, we have these double bounds in uh, urban areas mainly because we have you have the the dihedral between the soil and the, and the houses, the, the walls of the houses, and on forests the, the the dihedral between the soil and the trunks, and finally, whenever you have HV high, it is related to volume scattering that. Uh, normally, it appears in the canopy of the trees, for instance. Also, this is also this is modulated also by the frequency. Okay, because uh, the higher the frequency, the lower the penetration. The lower the frequency, the higher the penetration. So it's a combination of these two things. In here, I showed uh, one example. This is uh, south of Madrid. It's the capital of Spain. I mean, this is a kind of a uh, more or less flat area taken by the Circis sensor at Elvan and Sibel. This is what a single um, a single channel star system sees. What happens if I have polarimetry? If I have polarimetry and I code, as indicated in here, the public component in different colors, I can create the uh, color composite, the RGB. So if you remember the previous slide, Okay, I said that whenever HH plus BB is high, we are uh, in a surface. So basically, all the areas that you uh, see as blue correspond to surface scattering. Those uh, which are uh, high in green, HB, correspond to volume scattering. Okay, and those we are, uh, which, are, or who, which are high in, in red correspond to double. Uh, 
double scattering. That double bounce scattering. So you can identify already the geometry. In red, I don't know if you see it, but in the top of the image, you have a red line that crosses all the, all the image. And in this case, we have the double bounce created by power lines because it's a long, thin uh, dipole, the power line. So basically, you create a dipole, sorry, a double bounce between the power line and the soil. And if you compare both images, at Elvan, in the central part, you see that is a bit more uh, blue in the case of L1 if compared with C1, because and C1, we have more volume scattering because we have less penetration. So these are the two, the two modulations we have, the one of the geometry and the one due to the frequency. Here you have a second example, and this example corresponds to the Santiago de Chile. And this is the same, the same sensor, CRC at L1, at C1, okay? And therefore, you can already identify from the color the type of target you have. You may see in blue, and the, if you see at the left bottom part, you see two spots of blue, which correspond to lakes. You also see the blue in the top of the mountains because you, you have no vegetation, and if, we, if you look at the city, you see some houses that are red and some houses that are blue. And why this? The reason is, is quite simple, is that when the houses are really well oriented to the, to the satellite, to the, to the trajectory of the satellite, okay, you have a perfect double bound. And this is why you see red or ping here, because it's a perfect uh, double bounce. Nevertheless, the orientation of the houses, okay, at different points or at different regions are not oriented or are not parallel to the trajectory. So in that case, you don't have a perfect, uh, a, a perfect uh, double bounce, okay, corner reflector, but you have a more volume scattering, okay? so. Nowadays, there are uh, techniques of signal processing techniques, basically based on uh, what they are called polarimetry decomposition that try to decompose the signal that are able to cope with, this, uh, with these differences, okay? In, the, in there, you can go to the, to, the, to the work of our colleagues in India, in Mumbai, from the group of Avik Patashara, that basically, tries to analyze or to cope with this difference. So they are able to more or less uh, to classify all these areas in the same way. Here is another example. This is an, uh, is, is an, is not a satellite, it's an uh, airborne system. So in this case, uh, I have put the, the Pauli channels and the composition and already from the chorus, you can see uh, the, the different type of targets. In the middle, you see something which is the green, which correspond to forest. Okay, you can see some uh, urban areas. Okay, which have uh, which have a red color, but also you see some fields here and here or at the bottom of, of the image that are also red. And this is typical in crops because the crops are really well aligned. They are really well planned. So are geometrically perfect. So this is why you see in some crops, in some crops, in this particular case at Elban, you see a perfect double bounce, okay? What's the problem? The problem is that we replicate the idea that we had with waves. In case of point targets, if I go back to the previous slide, you see they're in the houses, uh, in the cars, and so on. In those cases, we have uh, a deterministic target. So our polarization state of the wave are uh, deterministic. So the scattering matrix is deterministic. So from there, we can extract all the information. Nevertheless, I go back. In the case of distributed target, like in the forest, or in the grass, or in the crops, uh, 
from tree to tree or from crop to crop, if they change the mi microscopic arrangement. So in that case, the scattering matrix has an, uh, a given distribution. Collectively, this distribution is called as a speckle noise. But in order to extract the information in case of distributed scatters, you need to cope with this uh, speckle noise, with this random behavior of the scattering matrix. And the way to deal with that is to consider, first of all, the distribution of the data, okay? And the most simple case is the multidimensional Gaussian distribution that leads to Wisher's distribution and so on. Okay, and you have, uh, or you can also handle this problem with filtering. Huh? You have uh, many, many contributions with definitely different filters just to eliminate this random behavior. Okay. Okay, we have, we have defined the wave polarimetry. I mean, we know uh, when we refer to polarimetry, we know to, to, to which property of the field uh, of the field we uh, we refer. We have defined how to use this information in terms of the scattering uh, of the scattering matrix, and we see that this information is sensitive to the geo essentially to the geometry in the context of this talk is sensitive to the geometry of the of the target. And now it comes the question: how to use this information? There are many many applications that can use this uh, number of channels. In particular, okay, what we make is an inversion. When we play with polarimetry, we make an inversion. That means that we go from the measurements, okay, to some physical models of our targets. In here, I have depicted uh, some trees because I mean, I was interested in trees some, at some point, but basically our idea is which, I mean, with inversion, I mean that we want to retrieve some information from our target of interest from the measurements. And the type of information I want to retrieve depends on the target and depends on my application, okay? So basically I'm going to explain this for, or these steps, this simple step for some types of application. Perhaps the most, in the, the most standard uh, application for polarimetry, because we have a better discrimination of the target, is classification, okay? In this particular case, I'm going to show a very simple example, which is supervised classification, considering the distribution of the data, okay? I will not enter into the, the description of the uh, statistics because they are, I mean, they are complex and you have all the references where you can analyze this distribution. But the basic idea is the basic idea of a, a, a training, sorry, a, a supervised classification, okay? You take some training areas, you take some samples, you train a classifier with these uh, training areas. It can be a very simple classifier as, uh, uh, as this uh, Wisher classifier, which is based on the statistics, or you can use extremely advanced classifiers based on artificial intelligence, which are now a, a hot topic. But the idea is exactly the same, using more complex tools to improve the result. But the idea is, is this. This is the, the result we, that I have obtained with the, with the Wisher classifier. And if we, if we look at, at the confusion matrix, okay, we see uh, that in, uh, in some, for some classes, we obtain very good classification accuracy. For other classes, basically, we, we have a confusion between classes. So ba the basic idea of, I mean, the, most, uh, the more advanced uh, techniques uh, nowadays based on artificial intelligence is how to improve the classification uh, results. But, the, but the, the basics are these. Here, I would like also uh, so to, to, to show some results uh, in forest classification, thanks to Dr. Johnson Lee okay, from the NRL in, in Washington. So here you have uh, uh, Flevoland data. It's, it is, this is in the north of uh, Holland, okay? And in that case, 
uh, we were, uh, the interest was in to see which is the information content of polarimetry and the information content of frequency. So data were acquired at P, L, L, and C1. And the most important thing is that we had a ground truth so we could compare. So here you have on the left, you have the result uh, of, the, uh, of the Pauli decomposition. Remember, blue surface scattering, uh, red double bounce scattering, green volume, okay? So you can already distinguish in which uh, fields you, you, which fields you don't have vegetation, in which fields you have, uh, you have trees and so on. And if we consider the previous classifier, the Wishart classifier is with seven, we obtain a 66% uh, overall classification accuracy, which is not, I mean, it's relatively good. If we go to Elvin, we improve uh, dramatically the classification accuracy, 81%. Per, uh, 81%. Percent. This is why um, when considering vegetation studies, we try to go to L1 because you have more penetration, so that you are more, uh, more capable to uh, have information about the canopy, the soil, the interactions, and so on. Uh, so for forestry, especially L1 and in particular P1 are better frequency. This is the, the P1, 71, a little bit less, okay, so basically, if we go to Elvan, I we could already see from these simple results that Elvan is optimum for forest classification, for instance. Okay, but we can also combine all of them. And in there, you can see that thanks to polarimetry and thanks to multi-frequency, we can improve our overall accuracy. So in, in this particular case, you have to think on frequency another kind of diversity. If you remember the first slide I presented at the beginning of, of the presentation, I said that we could also have multidimensional multi-frequency SAR system. So in here we are combining both sources of the diversity, polarization and frequency. There is also the possibility to uh, define unsupervised without training basically based on the on the characteristics of the on the physical characteristics of the of the data okay in that particular case you 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 can obtain another classification scheme okay and i wanted to just to present uh, uh, to present uh, this result just to compare that uh, you can do or you can obtain both supervised and unsupervised, okay? And if you want, uh, polarization, polarimetric data is especially suited for defining classification based on these uh, machine learning approaches that basically may infer in a better way the properties of the terrain. And the last result I wanted to, to show is which is the contribution of uh, polarimetry for change detection. In change detection, we basically, we are playing with different images in time, okay? So it's another kind of uh, multidimensional star system, time plus polarimetry. In this particular case, we had images in the, uh, you have here the Mediterranean Sea, this is Barcelona city, and we had images in the north of the city obtained with Radarsat 2 and ALOS at three different times, okay? Between 2007 and 2009. These are the results for the different dates for the ALOS images. Again, uh, red means double bounce, which in this case corresponds to urban areas. Blue corresponds to surface. Uh, green corresponds to uh, to forest, to canopy, to volume scattering. So again, polarimetry is sensitive to the geometry of that. These are the results for the radars at two. Radars at two is at C1, the previous ones, ALOS is at L1, so you see strictly different things. 
What if we detect the changes using the polarimetric information? In here, we define an algorithm to detect change. So basically, the idea is that red means no change, blue means complete change. So the three images on the left represent the, the changes seen in only HH between the 2007 and 2009. In the middle, between uh, in BB and on the right, on the HV. On the far right, what we see is which are the changes we detect in the case of fully polarimetric data. So as you can see, the benefit of using polarimetry is extremely high when detecting changes. We are more sensitive to detect changes. And the spot on the, and in the middle corresponds to the forest fire that occurred in the 2001, that still has the signature on the area. This is also the change detected between 2009 and 2007, and you can see exactly the same type of change. We obtain more information, more sensitivity to the change. That's the, the word we have, more sensitivity to the change in the case of using polarimetry. So therefore, if we combine multi-time and polarimetry, we can improve change detection. We are improved in the sense that we are more sensitive. We can also combine the three images. We can detect the, the collective changes between the three images. And in this particular case, we also see that polarimetry gives us more sensitivity to the changes on the, uh, on the three images. Because as you can see, your dynamic range of changes between the images with full polarimetric data is higher than in the single channel cases. What happens uh, in the case of urban areas? In this particular case, uh, we didn't have a, a ground truth to see the changes. But as you can see, there are some blue spots, dark blue spots on the urban area. So because of the changes or the delay between the two images is almost two years, we consider that these small changes are corresponds or correspond to changes due to new buildings or old buildings. So due to the, or thanks to the high spatial resolution, we can detect changes at the level of buildings. If we switch to, uh, to Sivan, radar cell two, we have the same type of, uh, of area. In this case, the swath or, or, or the footprint of the images didn't uh, take the area of the forest fire I indicated before, okay? But you see the, uh, the, same, the same type of, ch of changes. And I, I will particularly focus on the top of the image, which correspond to agricultural areas together with urban areas. So these are the changes between two dates, again, Polarimetry gives us more sensitivity to changes. In this particular case, uh, there are a lot of changes because the fields, the, the crops have been harvested surrounding the city. So these are the changes you see. You see the effects of the harvesting. So you are sensitive to those, to those changes. And you, again, you have more sensitivity thanks to uh, polarimetry. And these are, if we combine the three images, okay? You obtain, or polarimetry gives us more sensitivity to changes, okay? And here you have a detail of the, of, the, of the area. So you see that the blue areas correspond to the harvested fields and the red areas correspond to the urban areas. So as you can see, polarimetry gives us a lot of sensitivity to see uh, or to detect the, uh, practices that are, uh, or that take place, the harvesting practices that take place at these, uh, at these crop areas, okay? And just to, to, to close uh, this, uh, this presentation, I would like to give three uh, take home messages. First of all, and this is very important, so systems allow to retrieve high spatial resolution 
independently of the weather condition or the day-night cyclists. So they are complementary to optical images, okay? Polarimetric data are sensitive essentially to the geometric properties and the dielectric properties of the targets. So in this lecture, I focus particularly in the geometric properties, that is on the shape, or on the type of target, double bounds, single bounds, volume. But polarimetry gives also sensitivity to the dielectric property. So it's a very good candidate to obtain moisture information, okay? The gain of information is obtained on the one hand uh, from the fact that we have several information channels, but also the type of diversity we are using. We are using polarimetric diversity, so therefore we are sensitive to the geometry of the target. And finally, again, as I said before, uh, the interpretation of the polarimetric images are different from those of optical. They are not better, they are not worse. They are complementary because they are sensitive to different type of properties. Geomet uh, sorry, polarimetry is sensitive to the, the geometry, optical is sensitive to the, to the chemistry. So therefore, I am referring to plants. So therefore, both sources of information are complementary, okay? So this is all what I wanted to present you today regarding uh, polarimetry. It's the basics of polarimetry, okay? And now uh, I will close here. And if some one of you have questions, I'll be glad to, to answer those questions. I have a question if I might ask. Yes, sure. Sure, uh, I'm Aaron Thompson from University of Waterloo, first of all. Um, thanks for the presentation, I really enjoyed it. Um, and um, so the question I have is um, on, I think it was about slide 24, uh, where you showed the, the poly, um, what are they, the poly indices or something like that. Mm -hmm. Particularly, uh yeah. The, uh, the volume scattering, the, the cross pole term. Uh, I'm going to, to uh, wait a moment. I think the 24, right? I'm going there. This one. Uh, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, so the, um, the last term there, the volume scattering, um, the HV term. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you can scroll now ahead one slide to 24. This one? Uh, oh, maybe 25, sorry. This one? Yeah, um, so my question is, the the term in green at the top, the cross pole term. Um, why why does it have a factor of two in front of it? Okay, it? okay, uh, yeah, it, it, it's it's a pure technical, it's a pure technical, uh, it's a detail, it's a technical detail. And if I go to the uh, uh, to the scattering matrix, uh, I don't know. Here, if, when I create the the, uh, the Pauli components, you see this S, S, HH plus SVB, HH minus VB, and indeed you have two channels, S, SHV and SVH. So basically it's the addition of these two channels because you have, to, you have uh, uh, two times this channel. It's just to compensate and to normalize to the same level of power, the three Pauli decomposition, the, the, the three Pauli components. Okay, so you're conserving, basically conserving the energy. Yeah, you can. I mean, because if you don't put the number, two, the, the two, the factor two, uh, you will tend to have higher power in the case of the single bounds and the double bounds. So, but this is, I mean, when you make the equations, 
I mean, you have uh, these two going everywhere. I mean, I didn't put it because maybe I forgot to, to include it. But the idea is that independently of the two, the HV contains the information about volume scattering. Okay, okay. Great, thank you very much. Welcome. Carlos, uh, I have a question. And, and first, thank you for such a comprehensive and, and beautiful presentation. Uh, this is really uh, did, is wonderful justice to polar metric SAR. So I, I appreciate that a lot. Thank you. My, my question is uh, of the various dimensions in the polar metric data, uh, you really focused on three quite well, uh, but the other two, the, the phase variables, I'm just wondering uh, what might be offered by those and I know there's a little harder to measure uh, in most systems. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the I have to be honest. I didn't uh, normally when we represent the. Uh, I mean, I agree with you. When I use the, the powers, I don't represent all the polarimetric information. This is true, but this is a limitation on for representation into images. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. But phase information is also sensitive to the geometry and especially to the soil moisture content of the, of the signal. It is really sensitive to the moisture content. Mm -hmm. yeah. On, on, on uh, natural targets. I mean, on urban targets, it will be mainly sensitive to the geometry because uh, the sign of this phase will depend on the geometry. But in case of... Um, in case of, 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 of natural targets, bare areas, it will be really sensitive to the moisture content of the, of the, of the soil. The surface, the surface moisture content. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, thank you very much, Carlos. Welcome. I have a couple of questions as well, if I may. Hi, I'm, I'm Arvind from uh, CU Boulder. And uh, so initially you mentioned, I think on slide uh, 20, you said uh, you just represented the Jones matrices. And you also mentioned that, uh, oh, maybe one before that, I guess. Uh, in any case, you said that uh, the swath is reduced by half because you can't do simultaneous, uh, simultaneous measurement of uh, the, all the, all the, components of the Jones matrix. But is there is there a large frequency dependence for the S terms? And if not, can you use a different frequency for the horizontal polarization, slightly different frequency for uh, the horizontal polarization? Ah, this is, uh, I mean, uh, how to answer properly these questions? I mean, the elements of the S matrix, all of them must be, um, measure under the same conditions, time, frequency, geometry, etc. Right. Okay. The targets present the so-called frequency decorrelation. Basically, if you measure the terms at different frequencies, they decorrelate. And you want to avoid this decorrelation. It's the same in time. I mean, I didn't say, it, but, but as you see in this matrix, uh, or in this way to measure, you measure two columns. I mean, if the scatter changes between both acquisitions, it completely, I mean, the, the, the yes, scattering yeah. matrix completely decorrelates. One type of target where this doesn't work, mainly is water, because the water, the decorrelation time is extremely high. So it's the same situation in frequency. As you go away from, from the frequency, the properties of the scatter change with the, with, uh, with the frequency. Of course, it would depend on the targets. You may have targets where the, the correlation in frequency is very low, so you could do that, that or other targets that change dramatically. Okay? And in the case, of, and in the case of, of distributed targets, a small change in frequency is dramatic in the, in the change of the, of, the, of the system. Now, there are some technical advances use uh, co pulse uh, coding, okay? And maybe with pulse coding, I mean, co with codes, you can maybe to, to, to measure both at the same time, but then 
But they, normally in all SAR systems, they use the classical HB separated between the two columns. Great. And I had a second one as well. Okay. Uh, so there's also a geometry dependence uh, of the scatterers. Like you showed us one of the SAR plots with uh, the houses, which return okay. a double, a double bonds from one orientation, but it may not return a double bonds from a different, slightly different geometry, viewing geometry. So yeah, how do you so, I mean, assuming that the satellite just, assuming, okay, so say this image that, you're, that we're looking at right now, right now the houses that are in pink are well aligned for double yes. bonds. So if you took this image, say, I don't know, half a second later or half a minute later and not half a minute, maybe, but maybe say five seconds later and the viewing geometry was different, but the underlying nature of the scatter, the physical nature of the scatter is still the same. The houses are still houses, vegetation is still vegetation. So how do you compensate for viewing geometry in your... I mean, the, the bio wind geometry, I mean, it is true that you, um, but um, that uh, when acquiring from, from orbital systems, okay, the two columns, there is a slight change in the geometry, but the, we are talking about a PRF of one kilohertz uh, or two kilohertz, and therefore the change in the geometry, it's really, really small. So you can consider that in particular case, uh, for this particular case of, of houses, then do, do not affect. Right, so you're just sampling fast enough that you Yeah, have... you're sampling fast enough to, to avoid the problem. Of course, it may, you may have some particular exotic targets where uh, this is not true. I uh, totally agree with you, but in the general case, the sampling is so high that you can assume that both that the, the geometry of the both columns in which, which both columns of the scattering matrix are acquired is the same. Oh, no, I, I was not talking about uh, variation during acquisition. I was talking about when you're classifying. So you're- Ah, the, the, the okay, oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. No, this is because uh, when you use, um, how to call it, uh, target decomposition theorem, which is an advanced tool for processing uh, tool, you compensate for, for these effects. As uh, we were said before, in this particular case, you are only using, uh, or I'm only showing the intensity information. You can use also the fully polarimetric information, considering also the phases, to compensate for those effects. Right. Okay. I, if you are interested into that, I would recommend you to go in the direction of target decomposition theorems. Okay, thank you. Welcome. There is any other question? Carlos, I think you did a nice job with presenting the information and uh, giving it. Uh, Quite a bit of feedback from your audience. Hope you enjoyed presenting. It was a pleasure. And, uh, he has obviously lots of publications out there. I was surprised how many of them were available without having to log into anything. So, <laughs> so uh, feel free to dive deeper and uh, and uh, give him some feedback if there's. Some, some issues that you're trying to get to the answers on. Okay, as I said before, I mean, you the, you can find my contact information and you can send me an email, I'll be happy to answer. And, uh, with that, I guess we can close out the meeting. Is there anyone else that wants to chime in? Uh, I, I thought it was a Thought it was a very nice presentation. I'm Ken Scribseth, and I'm in uh, I'm retired L Laurel, Maryland. Uh, been to many universities, but I was, my question is: How did you normalize between the different radar bands? Did you do it automatically, or did you have to play around with it? No, because what you um, what you mix is the classification results. You don't mix the the pure. Uh, intensity information, let's say. You compensate or you, you combine at the classification step. step. You, don't, uh, you don't fuse at the uh, raw, raw data step. 
So you don't need to compensate for that. Okay, thanks very much. Welcome. I will let you get back to your evening uh, then, uh, Carlos. And okay. Everybody you. for uh, signing in. Okay, so stay safe and take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, Carlos. Bye. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.